Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I am here to try and make medicine make sense. I'm here to share about an important question. Do mRNA vaccines circulate? Well, that means is do they circulate in the bloodstream? And so this is an important question, and one you think that we would have gotten an answer for by now. As far as I can remember, we've been reassured that this isn't an issue. But well, this clearly was based on research and not just an opinion. And that's what I would have thought. But here is an important paper that I'm going to share with you. It's recently been published in the past few months. And I think it highlights the gaps that are existent in our scientific understanding about what happens with regards to COVID-19, with regards to long COVID, even with regards to vaccination. And so here is an important paper that I'll share some ideas and some concepts with you about. But before I do, I'd just like to encourage you to join me here on Substack, Everything COVID-19 Post, Podcasts and Videos since March 2020. And the link will be below. So again, do mRNA vaccines circulate? So let's start with the paper. So this was a paper that was done uh, probably in published, as you can see here, if you look at the top, if you can see my mouse pointer, it's the title is vaccine mRNA can be detected in the blood at 15 days post vaccination. Interesting, isn't that? Wow. Where was this done and when was this done? Uh, here it was published on the 28th of June, 2022. I'm going to come back to that uh, shortly because I think that those are important questions in terms of publication time and so on. But just as important, I always check whenever I look at a paper, who are the funders? Because it, it helps you to understand the perspective sometimes of the funding of the research. People tend to fund what is in their interest or what they're looking for. So when you look at that here, the funding was supported by the Ministry of Research, Innovation and Digital Digitalization of Romania through grants. Um, it conducted it in, in accordance with the Declaration of Helsinki. So that's good as well. Um, and you can see conflicts of interest here. Some of the authors donated blood for their study but no commercial company ties exist. That's a good sign. That indicates that this is genuinely independent review. And we do appreciate the um, authors and it's always important to highlight them and you probably can't see them fully here, but uh, Tudor Emmanuel Fertig is the main one. And usually at the end, the supporting uh, major author, Michaela, uh, I can't pronounce this, um, is also there. And you can see this was done from the Institute of Pathology in Romania. So this is good, valuable work that was done by these scientists. So they published in MDPI. What is that? Well, MDPI, as you can see here, is an open access publishing platform based in Switzerland, and it's there to foster open scientific exchange in all forms across all disciplines. That's essentially the point about what they're doing. They have over 393 diverse peer-reviewed open access reach, um, journals, and critically, they are freely available. So this is a large publication platform that is open access and freely available. That's an important point. Because when you think about researchers, they usually want to get their publications and some of the major um, of papers out there, Lancet, um, New England Journal of Medicine, you know, BMJ to a certain extent, but that's where they want to be. And so the interesting question is why did they use this platform? I don't have the answer for that, but that's one of the first thoughts that I was focused on. So at the end of this, I'm going to come back to this point, but let me just make a principle in terms of the research. So what is it that they were looking for? You can see here the lipid nanoparticles 
Uh, this would have been injected from a vaccine because they were specifically looking at mRNA vaccines. So these would have been lipid nanoparticles injected in the deltoid muscle in the arm. These would then get inside cells, muscle cells, and probably some immune cells that are located there. Uh, the lipid nanoparticles would then release the mRNA, which would then be processed to make spike protein. The spike protein critically gets anchored to the surface of the cell. So from the perspective of what the research would tell us, therefore, the lipid nanoparticles are stuck in the shoulder. They stay there. They don't go anywhere else. And the spike proteins stay in the region of the local lymph nodes. And therefore, there is little risk for systemic spread, meaning that if it was to circulate throughout the whole body, would that be relevant? Yes because it could have impacts on distant organs. And in the context of some of the work that I look at with autoimmunity, this is actually very important. Here is a piece of the puzzle that we haven't yet really focused on. And it's this concept of exosomes. So if you remember the lipid nanoparticles that we inject in terms of the vaccine, we're actually replicating a system that all cells use called exosomal transport. What that means is that they make these little nanoparticles and they transport them from cell to cell. So this here is an important paper that we can see, a review of biophysics, biology, and biochemistry of exosomes. So what cells do is that any, any thing that they want to either get rid of or to share, so including things like interferons, they package them into these little nanoparticles and they put them out into the extracellular space where they will then circulate and be able to be picked up by other cells. That's exosomal transport. And it's, it's an important aspect of how cells function. All cells do it, and they do it to varying degrees. But the point is, is that it is a mechanism either for the cell to get rid of waste material or for it to be able to share important material to other cells. So exosomal transport occurs all the time. So how does that fit in the context of the lipid nanoparticles? So the question is, could exosomes pick up some of the mRNA or even the spike protein and then transport it around the body? That would be, in my sense, one of the important questions that we would have to answer. Well, here is what the research found. And I'll, I'll go first to their, uh, their primary images here. And you can see here, days after vaccination, over here, um, days after vaccination, um, and they are looking at the copies of RNA in the bloodstream. So they check the plasma for this. And you can see day zero, Day one, two, three, four, five, six. So here we are looking as well. You can see here at day zero, uh, the levels are relatively low, but then they rise by about day four and they stay there for about two weeks. And when we look at uh, this chart here, this shows a distribution with regards to plasma in green, uh, white blood cells in orange. What we can see day zero, in the plasma, it was detected right after. Um, and the white blood cells tended to decrease and then fall off by a week. But the plasma levels remained largely stable up to 15 days after. How could that happen? How is that possible? And this is them, and they, they, you have to look at the paper, and the link will be in the, in the description, but you can read the paper yourself. And they did correlate this with healthy donors, people who were not vaccinated. And so you can see that in the vaccinated cohort, there is circulation of mRNA for up to 15 days after the vaccine. That's important. Why would we only be seeing this now? This is 18 months down the line. So here is an important thing that I looked at with regards to this publication timeline. Now, this paper, they collected the samples between January and May 2021. 16 individuals who had received the first or second dose. Yet, 
Their paper was received on the 25th of May, 2022, revised on the 15th of June, and published on the 28th of June, 2022, almost a year later. Now, if anyone has any experience with publications, what tends to happen is that you may submit your paper for publication. It then goes through a lengthy period of time for peer review, and eventually that paper may be discarded. And so the question is, what happened in that previous year? Because it's unlikely they sat on this. They would have been trying to publish. Which papers were they trying to publish to? that didn't want to publish it for whatever reason. They may have thought the quality of the research wasn't good enough. They may have thought that it wasn't convenient to talk about this kind of stuff. But that's a very important question that only the authors will actually know the answers for. And here is the quote from the paper that stands out the most. The biodistribution and functional half-life of vaccine-associated S-protein mRNA in humans is currently unknown. What that means, what they're saying, is that nobody has ever done these studies. No one has done biodistribution studies in humans, even though we have administered over 11 billion vaccines. How do we explain that? That really is an important question. And I, I, can't, I can't explain why this wouldn't have been done. It seems as though it's an obvious question to ask. So when we ask, do mRNA vaccines circulate based on the evidence here, they do. Does it have any relevance in the context of what some of the longer term implications are for COVID-19 vaccines? We don't know, but we need to know. We need to understand. We need to find the answers to these very, very important questions. So I'm sure you will join me as I continue to share my work on YouTube and Substack. Please uh, join the journey of research in understanding more about COVID-19.